Hello, scholars. Some key ideas from what you just read at the very beginning of chapter 2, the top of page 59. We're going to be exploring limits of functions in this chapter. We can explore limits using substitution, using graphs, using tables of values, and by using algebra. You might recall the last example we did in the last slide set. We used a table of values to try to figure out what would happen to instantaneous speed if we let h get smaller and smaller. And then we used algebra to prove that we could get the same answer. So we have um, a second idea. We're going to talk about limits of functions. A limit, scholars, is a y value. It's an output value. It's a value of the function. Even if it never quite exists, it's still always a y value. X, um, limits are never x values. And just to give you a picture of where we're headed, we're learning about limits so that we can talk about continuity. And if there were no continuity, there would be no calculus. So recall at the end of the last slide set, we talked about computing instantaneous velocity. We said instantaneous speed. We said that we were going to let h be a number that was really, really close to zero, and we're going to let it get closer and closer and closer to zero. This idea of letting a value approach zero or approach infinity or negative infinity it's so important that for calculus we have a notation for it. It's called limit notation. Here's what it looks like. The same problem. I can say that the instantaneous velocity is the limit as h approaches 0 of that same function I had before. 16 times 2 plus h squared minus 16 times 2 squared all over h. I can see that my, in my slides that the minus signs aren't showing but you can picture them there. So, this is limit notation. More about that in this section. So let's approach... Let's explore another limit. Here's a function, y equals sine of x over x. The question is, what happens in this function when x gets close to zero? We know from algebra what happens when x equals zero, because I'll try to plug in 0 for x, and I'll have the sine of 0 divided by 0. I can't divide by 0. I know this function will be undefined when x equals 0. But still, with the power of calculus, the power of limits, I don't have to stop my discussion there. I can explore what happens in the function near the place where x equals 0. So one way to explore is to make a graph. Here's a picture of the graph of sine x over x. And you can see from here, if I look at the place where x equals 0, it looks like the function value should probably be y equals 1. Now, if I actually zoomed in on that function, there'd be a hole there, because f of 0 is not defined. But I can at least explore what would happen nearby. Another way we can explore this is with the a table of values. So I could let x be some small numbers small negative numbers close to zero, and I can see that the numbers as I get closer and closer to zero approach one, and the same pattern is going to continue on the other side of zero. So we can say, based on our investigation using a graph and a table, that it seems like the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x is one. So this is the notation we use, limit notation, the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l. And you can see I've written out the words there so you know how to say this. So based on the function we just explored, the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x equals 1. Or the limit of sine of x over x as x approaches 0 is 1. Now you have two options, my scholars, specifically for this one limit you can choose. You can memorize that the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x is 1. It's true for this function. I, it's, I only make the promise that it's true for this function. If you're interested in proving it, you have another option, which is to learn the sandwich theorem at the end of this section, 2.1, and submit your work for problem 75. Don't make this choice. All I need you to do is remember the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x.